Hello students, welcome to another video of Mathify. In today's video, we'll be doing paper 4, course score 0625. It's month May, June 2024 and it's variant 3. So first question says, a ball of mass 130 gram is launched from the ground at initial velocity 14 meter per second vertically upward. It deaccelerates until it is at rest momentarily at height h above the ground. Define acceleration. So we are going to launch a ball vertically upward until it reaches height h and it becomes stationary. Its initial velocity was 14 meter per second. So the question is define deacceleration. It is rate of decrease of velocity. Whenever velocity increases, we say it's accelerating and velocity decreases, we say body is deaccelerating. B part says the acceleration of free fall is 9.8 meter per second squared. Show that the time taken for the ball to reach the height h is 1.4 second. Ignore the effect of air resistance. So we are supposed to calculate the time taken by the ball to reach the height h. So height is uh, our distance in this case and we are also provided with gravitational acceleration and the initial velocity which is 14 and the mass of the ball which is m. So we, can, uh, we have multiple formulas. First is time is distance over speed. Another one is acceleration is change of velocity over time. And the third one for the time is impulse formula. I can't use the first one because I don't have the distance. And I can't use the third one because I don't have the force. I can use this acceleration formula because I have acceleration and change of velocity. So time would be change of velocity over acceleration. Velocity change is final velocity minus initial velocity divided by acceleration. Final velocity is uh, zero because the body uh, is supposed to be at rest at the end. And initial velocity is 14. Acceleration is 9.8. Solving this, it will give me 1.4 seconds. I'll ignore the sign. C part says calculate the height. Ignore the effect of air resistance. So we are supposed to calculate the height over here. For example, the ball is going to move upward. Initially, the height is at 0 and the initial velocity is 14. As the height is 0, so potential energy would also be 0 and kinetic energy would be maximum. When the ball start moving upward, its uh, height start increasing. So potential energy got increased and kinetic energy start converting into potential energy. At the maximum height h, uh, the velocity of the body uh, is zero because it's at rest. So kinetic energy would be zero and potential energy would be maximum as height is maximum. So all of the kinetic energy has been converted into potential energy. So we can say that the kinetic energy at the ground level is equal to the potential energy at maximum height if there is no energy loss or we ignore the air resistance. So kinetic energy is half mv square, potential energy is mgh, m would be cancelled out with m. It would be v squared over 2 equals to gh. Now I will arrange it with respect to h. It would be v squared over 2g. Putting in the values, v is 14. I'll take square of 14. 2 multiplied by 9.8 which is the value of acceleration. So the final answer or height is 10 meter. D part says the ball is dropped from the top of tall building. Describe and explain the motion of the ball as it falls. Consider the effect of air resistance in your answer. So this time we are supposed to consider the resistance. So ball is at height h. Initially, it will accelerate and its velocity will increase while falling. But due to the air resistance present in the environment, its velocity start decreasing. That means it start deaccelerating. And after some moment, the downward force resultant force is equal to the air resistance. So this ball reaches a constant or a terminal velocity. So initially, the ball accelerate at 9.8 meter per second square due to resultant force of gravity. 
then the air resistance reduces the resultant force at it and the body deaccelerates when the resultant force become equal to air resistance the ball attain constant velocity second question says figure 2.1 shows solar powered traffic warning lights so there are traffic lights which are powered by this solar lamp the energy from solar cell is stored in the battery name the energy stored in the battery so battery is always stored chemical energy in them b part says the two lights in figure 2.1 are connected in parallel state one advantage of parallel connection in lights so for example we have a series circuit over here and the current is flowing in this way so if this lamps fail this will block the flow of current and the other lamp won't also work but if we have a parallel connection even though one current one lamp fails the other will still work so the answer is if one lamp breaks the other will still work in parallel combination c part says the efficiency of solar lamp is 22% the power supplied to the light by the cell is 15 watt state what is meant by 22% efficiency so it means 22% of total power supplied is useful and other is just going to waste calculate the solar power input of the solar cell so you know efficiency is power output over power input multiplied by 100 we need the power input so i'll rearrange this equation power input would be power output over efficiency multiplied by 100 power output is 15 watt the efficiency is 22 multiplied by 100 so the answer is 68 watt of input power d part says suggest two advantages of using solar cell to power the traffic lights in figure 2.1 compared to using main electricity so why are we not using the direct current and using solar lamp instead because it will no longer the need of cables and less power would be used third part says figure 3.1 shows two children balanced on a seesaw a seesaw is of length of wood which rotates about a central pivot so here's child A, here's child B. Weight of child A is 450 Newton. It is 1.6 meter away from the pivot. Weight of child B is 900 and it is 0.8 meter away from the pivot. And the thing to be noted is the seesaw is balanced. That means clockwise moment is equals to anti-clockwise moment. So here are the two moments. This one is anti-clockwise and this one is clockwise. Child B moves 0.05 meters further away from the pivot. Explain why the seesaw rotates clockwise. Firstly, it was balanced. When the child moves 0.05 meters away from the pivot, the seesaw start moving in a clockwise direction. That means this way. So wh why does this happen? Because you know, moment is four times distance or distance from the pivot. So if the distance increases, the moment increases. So as the child B moves away, the clockwise moment increases. So the seesaw start moving in a clockwise direction. Second part says the child A puts on a backpack and the seesaw is again balanced. Calculate the mass of the backpack. So firstly, this child is going to put a backpack and the clockwise motion would again be balanced. That means again the clockwise moment would be equal to the anti-clockwise moment. That means this moment F into D is equal to this F into D. Now assume that the weight of this backpack is X. So the total weight is 450 plus X times D which is 1.6 meter. Over here, the weight is 900 and D is 0 0.8 plus 0 0.05, which is 0 0.85. So 1.6 will go to that side and divide by the product of 900 and 0 0.85. And we will have 450 plus X is equals to 478. Now 450 will go to that side and subtract. So it would be 478 minus 450, which is 28 Newton. So this backpack has the weight of 28 Newton that balances the seesaw again. So if weight is 28 Newton, we are supposed to get the mass. Weight is equals to mass time gravitational acceleration. So mass is equals to weight divided by gravitational acceleration. Weight is 28 G is 9.8. So mass is 2.9 kg. 
B part says the concrete floor under the seesaw is replaced with a rubber floor. A child fall from the seesaw and experience an impulse when they hit the floor. Define impulse. So impulse is force multiplied by time for which the force acts. Or the second definition is impulse is equal to change in momentum of a body. Second part says explain how the rubber floor reduces the injury to the child. Use the idea about impulse, force, momentum and time in your answer. So I go with the two definitions of uh, impulse. I'll go with first definition first. Impulse is equal to change in momentum. And instead of impulse, I'm using the second definition. Force multiplied by time for which the force act is equal to change in momentum that means the force on a child would be equals to change in momentum divided by the time for which the force set so if we are using a rubber floor a rubber floor will increase the contact period or the child will be in contact with the floor for a greater time that means it will increase the time of contact so if the time of contact is increased the force on the child would be reduced so rubber increases the contact time of kid and floor that reduces the force on the kid and the injury is reduced. Question number four says figure 4.1 shows a stainless steel saucepan being heated on an electric cooker. The saucepan contains water. So uh, state what happens to the water particles as the water temperature increases. So there are particles in water when you will increase the temperature the particles will start moving faster that means their kinetic energy will increase. So the answer is the kinetic energy of particles will increase. B part says the saucepan contained 250 centimeter cube of water that, that is the volume. The specific heat capacity of water is 4200 joules per kg a degree celsius the density of the water is 100 gram per meter cube show that the mass of the water in the saucepan is 0 0.25 kg so we are going to calculate the mass of the water and we can use the density formula which is ma mass over volume so mass is density multiplied by volume but the volume is in centimeter cube and the density has the unit of meter cube so we need to convert centimeter cube into meter cube I'll divide it by 10 raised to power 6. So it would be 0 0.00025 meter cube. Uh, so density is 1000. Volume is 0 0.00025. So the mass is 0 0.25 kg. Second question says calculate the energy required to increase the water temperature from 20 degrees Celsius to 65 degrees Celsius. That means the total change of temperature would be 45 degrees centigrade. We have to calculate the energy. We have the specific heat and the mass as well. So I can use the specific heat energy formula which is mass times specific heat times change in temperature. Mass is 0 0.25. Specific heat is 4200 multiplied by 45. So the final heat that we required is 47,000 joules. Third part says... The heater supply enough power to heat water in 39 seconds. The student measure the time taken to heat the water as 115 seconds. Suggest why the actual time taken to heat the water is longer. Assume the student take the accurate measurements. So the time that should the water uh, take that is 39 seconds but the water takes more than that time. Where is this extra energy going? This energy is being lost in surrounding and the pen also absorbs some energy. C part says the stainless steel saucepan is replaced by aluminium saucepan of same mass. It contains the same volume of water. The specific heat of steel is 500 and the specific heat of aluminium is 890. Explain how using aluminium saucepan will affect the time taken to heat the water. So 1 kg of steel is going to consume 500 joules of energy to raise its temperature by 1 degree Celsius. And in the same case, 1 kg of aluminium is going to take 890 joules of energy 
to raise its temperature by 1 Celsius. That means aluminium requires more energy to raise temperature of 1 kg by 1 degree Celsius, so it will take a longer time. Five question says figure 5.1 shows two containers each filled with hot water. This is a container of metal and this is a container of non-metal. The outer surface of metal container is hot. Explain how electron transfer thermal energy through the metal of container. So metal have free electron inside the uh, structure and uh, you know the molecules can pass the heat by passing on the vibration and this process is known as conduction. But there are free electrons inside this latest structure that can actually move and collide with the other uh, electrons and atoms and they conduct heat by convection. So free electron gain energy and move through metal. They collide with other electrons and atom and transfer energy. B part says the outer surface of non-metal container is much cooler than the outer surface of metal container. Explain why non-metal conducts thermal energy less well than a metal. Because non-metal don't have free electrons to conduct heat. C part says explain in terms of particle why gases are poor thermal conductor compared to metals. So in gases the particles are far apart so they can't conduct heat by conduction because they can't pass on their vibration. But they also collide with each other very less often so they are less likely to collide and less likely to transfer heat so molecules are far apart so no lattice vibration to pass on heat and less collision between molecules so less heat is transferred thanks for watching the video if it was helpful please hit the like button and subscribe my channel